Seth, we all sort of want to know what it's all about. You know, what is the reality that we are born into and try to understand? And science has had a history of thinking that it's really understanding everything. And we know that it's been wrong many times in the past, of course. But today, with Einstein's theory of relativity, with quantum mechanics, granted there are some problems, but it seems that certainly many physicists say that, that we really do understand the workings of the universe so sufficiently that there really won't be any really big time surprises. Small time surprises, sure, but no really big time changes of our way of thinking, the way relativity was and the way quantum mechanics was. Do you agree with that? Well, I have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people think they do. Some people yeah. think they have an idea because of the fundamental nature of, of, of relativity, Einstein's relativity, and the fundamental nature of quantum mechanics that they feel they can say that these are so fundamental that, that there's not going to be anything of that character anymore. Yeah. Of course, back in the 19th century, people thought with their beautiful theory of classical mechanics <laughs> right. that everything was just perfect. They only had a few niggling, funny details <laughs> about this strange quantum-looking behavior to work out. And right. once that would be okay, and then, of course, the problem was it was like these little tiny details. They started pulling up like that, and then they pulled like that, and they pulled like that, and pretty soon the whole apparatus of classical mechanics had unraveled, and it turned out it needed to be replaced by quantum mechanics, which took 30 years, actually, right. to come around and replace it. So. Right. I'm always a little concerned when people think, oh, we're right at the end. If we can just get this, we'll solve all of our problems. Yeah, and quantum gravity is that little thing right at the end that people say, if I get that, it all, it's all Hey, done. I'm as guilty of that as anybody else. I'd love to have you know, a good theory of, of, of quantum gravity. But you know, suppose, uh, suppose that I or somebody else were, in fact, to make you know, a really good, correct theory of quantum gravity. Would, would, would it help me get a date on Saturday night? <laughs> Probably not. In fact, if there were a scientific way to get a date on Saturday night, believe me, MIT students would always have dates on <laughs> right, Saturday right, nights. Right. It's not true. Right. So I think empirically, uh, uh, science doesn't explain as much as maybe scientists would like to think. Okay, I mean, I mean that's certainly fine. And I don't think these scientists who claim that relativity and quantum mechanics say that it can explain all human behaviors and all society and is really a true theory of everything but what they mean is that at the most fundamental level there is not going to be any more dramatic revolution now it, you're uncertain and many people are uncertain that's fine if you are uncertain can you point to certain areas where we might look where if there will be some big advance in the future some breakthrough what are some ways we can, uh, 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 we might find those? Yeah, so, so let's suppose, just, I mean, I don't know if this is going to be the case or not. Let's suppose that, that we uh, manage to solve all our problems about elementary particle physics and quantum gravity, tie it up neatly in a ball and deliver it to Stephen Hawking's door, right? <laughs> suppose that somebody managed to do it by string theory or something else, right? That, uh, frankly, I think we're much further from that than people claim. I mean, if, if you look at string theory, for instance, it has this grand rhetoric about having you know, no parameters being a unique theory of what's going on, but yet the theory itself is not even by any means a theory, right? Even a string theorist will tell you that. But it's not complete. There are 10 to the 500 different you know, possible sets of laws of physics in the string theory landscape. And that doesn't sound like a nice tidy package mm -hmm. ready to be put into, mm -hmm. you know, tied up in a ball and delivered to Stephen Hawking's door. But let's suppose that, that, that this happens. So, okay, so, so we've figured out everything we can possibly figure out about the laws of physics at the most fundamental level, at the level of, you know, elementary particles and gravity. So what has it bought us? Well, actually, if you could do that, you probably would get a Nobel Prize and then you might be able to get a date <laughs> on Saturday night. So actually, it might solve another problem as well. But, but what other big problems would be out there to solve? Well, first of all, the, ir the irony of this is, okay, you've now you know, solved the, uh, this fundamental question about you know, the nature of reality, and yet it still tells you nothing about, say, the origin of life, you know, how life started up. Mm. Frankly, it tells you almost nothing about chemistry, because even though the laws of chemistry are determined by the laws of quantum mechanics, to start from just the laws of quantum mechanics and then predict 
chemistry, right. you know, predict without knowing what they are, what molecules would form. The right. fact that you know you have H2, right, or H2O, that is very, very hard, and you wouldn't get very far. So, so even if you know you've managed to get all the laws of physics, the next level of complexity, the level of chemistry, you're in a pretty hopeless state. And with chemistry, we know chemistry very, very well, but we still don't know how life originated. At every level, then, you know, there are these problems of increasing complexity, which knowing the fundamental laws of physics simply don't help us to grasp. But here's the question. Is it a matter of, of knowing sufficiently much about the more fundamental laws that will enable us to predict accurately what happens on the next level? And we just have to learn more and study more. Maybe it'll take a long time, but it's in principle doable. Or is it such that there are other kinds of laws that some people talk about that are needed on each different level, the level of chemistry or biology or the level of life, as you know, some people think that there's some other laws operating in those dimensions, which, which in a sense are as fundamental as the laws of physics, but on that level that are needed. Or is it derivable from what you find just with a lot of hard work? Oh, yeah. I, I would say no way there is, are the laws of biology derivable just from the laws of chemistry. Why? E even in principle. Even in principle. Why? Because, in fact, the laws of biology as we know them is probably only one possibility for the way that things like life could arise. And okay. there are a whole series of historical accidents, you know, in the the protobiotic world, before life actually arose to have you know, reproducing organisms, a whole bunch of historical accidents meant that when that life arose, it took on a certain form. Right. And unless you knew what those accidents were, the outcomes of those accidents, you wouldn't know that life is going to take on this form. So in fact, there's a real additional element of complexity that gets injected at each stage. In fact, additional information gets injected at each stage. In fact, this actually occurs at a very fundamental level, because uh, it seems to be the case that certain features of what we call the laws of physics, things like you know, masses of quarks or strengths of you know, coupling constants, may very well be determined by quantum accidents. Mm. So even things we call the laws of physics might in <laughs> fact be just you know, some <laughs> phenomenology that was determined accidentally by some little tiny quantum accident at the very beginning of the universe. So, at every stage along the way, when you go to more and more complex things, more and more information gets injected, you know, apparently random information, and to say what the laws are at the next level, you need to know what those bits are. And you can't know what those are a priori. I hate to do this to you to make you a forecaster, <laughs> a predictor, a prophet, a seer. If you would go out 1,000 years, 10,000, 100,000 years, yeah. and from that vantage point, describe what the science of those, that day would be compared to today, Right. what would you do? Well, of course, you know, the first thing that anybody does when they look at science of the past, they say, gosh, what idiots <laughs> they were. Didn't they understand <laughs> that, that X, Y, or Z, right? You know, so so, so uh, the history of science, and I, you know, I actually even have a master's degree in history of science from <laughs> Cambridge University. In fact, you could call me Dr. Science, right? Because, <laughs> I have a master's degree in philosophy, history of philosophy. But uh, yeah, when you look at the history of science, you see that the history of science is, is primarily a sad history of many, 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 many mistakes. That's what makes science science, right? Sure. I mean, the thing that makes scientific knowledge scientific is that it can be shown to be wrong. It can't be shown to be right. No. So right. whatever we have that we trust right now, we think it's right. Well, there's no proof that it's right. And it's probably wrong too, okay? And at some point down the line, we'll be replaced by something else, which also is probably wrong, but is righter than it was before. Yeah, but what you really see in the history of science is people make mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, but they realize they've made the mistakes, right? Um, Murray Gell-Mann, the Nobel laureate in physics, says the job of a theorist is to make mistakes as fast as possible. <laughs> Meaning, you know, come up with new ideas and show them to be wrong, and then go on to another new idea, which might be right. And gradually out of this process, you know, winnowing out the 99.999% of the stuff that's wrong, you end up with this little tiny, eensy weensy little bit, which just might be right. So, so I guess, uh, first of all, I would love to be able to yeah. sit 10,000 years in the future and find out which of those little tiny bits might in fact be right. But do you think the science as it, from that vantage point will be significantly different than it is today? It's possible, right? 
I mean, uh, uh, you, again, you, 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 you apologize for asking me to predict it. I, ne I never make predictions. Because, in fact, exactly because I studied history of science, I know that, that technological and scientific predictions, they're a mugs game. Your chances of being right are tiny. And why? Because, in fact, it's intrinsically unpredictable just which of these one out of 10,000, there are 10,000 things that might be right and only one of them is right. And if there were a way to predict which one it was before, and heck, you wouldn't have had to explore the other ones. So by its very definition, the future of science is unpredictable. We can't predict what those advances are going to be. Now, in fact, I like this, right? I mean, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be a scientist if I, I could live, couldn't live with uncertainty. In fact, it's just being a scientist means you have to live with uncertainty. There was a National Enquirer article many years ago I saw it said, Headline, Adam and Eve found on Mars, a picture of aliens underneath, scientists baffled, right? If you're not willing to be baffled, you shouldn't be a scientist.